Hi guys. I just want to welcome you to another episode of Powerline Podcast and say thanks very much for joining in. Um, this podcast is starting to grow and starting to really take some shape and take some form. And I just wanted to introduce this next podcast in a little bit different way than I've done so far and say that um, I'm really, really excited about this episode for a few reasons. Um, this podcast is the reason I started this podcast was to share the stories of the line trade and of the electrical industry and to capture these stories, these, these amazing stories and portray them in a modern way through podcasting, through storytelling, um, straight from the people that built these lines, designed these lines, or have had any sort of part in this industry. And this episode is um, with a man by the name of Peter Ketchpool. And uh, Peter designed uh, a catenary system. And some of you might know what the system is and some of you might might not. Um, I've been sharing photos on the Alltech Instagram page of of this catenary system for some time. Uh, and the first time I heard about this and heard about what was being done up in the Kildala Pass uh, in northern British Columbia. Um, it's between Kitimat, uh, BC, and Kamano. There's a 287 kV transmission line that runs up through the mountains. And um, it comes up over the mountaintop, about 5,000 feet up in the mountains, and drops down into this bowl. And Peter's going to get into explaining this and talking about it in detail. Um drops down into this bowl and then up through the bowl and up over the mountain, um, cresting the summit and down inside the bowl is where they ran the transmission line. There's about six towers down inside the bowl and it continuously got wiped out with wind and snow avalanches would wipe this line out. So, um, the line was originally constructed in the, in the early fifties, which is amazing in itself. And we'll talk about that. And then, um, continually would get wiped out, um, through the years. And so, um, uh, a man by the name of Brian White built the first catenary system. I believe it's the first in the world and built that, that catenary system, which is a, is a cabling system that goes from mountaintop to mountaintop and then suspends the power line underneath of it. And Peter, uh, came along several years later, uh, kind of learned some things from Brian and worked with him a bit and then came along later and designed and, and had a hand in building the second catenary system. And, um, it's, it's just a super amazing f feat of engineering and construction, construction by the linemen and engineering by the guys designing it and, and came together uh, as a team and built this uh, system that's still in operation today and it's still one of the, the best systems in the world. So I just wanted to come on and kind of set this episode up and introduce it before we actually got into it. So um, thanks again, guys, for, for tuning in and being a part of the growth of this podcast. Um, I'm so excited and just want to say thank you for all all the DMS and, and messages so far, uh, messages of support. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's really cool to see this thing grow. And this is one of those stories that I'm so happy to have captured and being able to share with you guys and capture for all of time and, and share for this industry. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into this, uh, episode 10 of Powerline podcast with Peter Ketchpole. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Peter Catchpole. Uh, I'd like to say welcome to the podcast here. First off, um, we're going to get uh, talking about a double circuit 287 kV transmission line that runs up in some pretty extreme mountainous condi conditions in British Columbia, Canada. 
um, it's pretty unique and we're going to get into talking about all these, all these reasons why it's unique in a second, but, uh, I'd like to start with a little bit about yourself and, and your background and how this, uh, how you came to work on this line. Um, well, good to see you too. Yeah. Um, I, I go way back and say, I, when, when this line was put in service in the end of 1954, November, I think, I'm told, um, I was six years old. I was about to be seven, I guess. And um, so I went into service, and I, sometime in the next year or so after that, and I'm living in Ontario at that time, southern Ontario. And um, I saw a photograph in a magazine back then, and I have looked for that photograph ever since. I've never found it. I, was, I thought it was National Geographic or Life or something, and, and but I can't find it. But it was a photograph of a mountainside, absolutely blank in pure white snow, kind of undulating, you know, it wasn't dead flat or anything like that. But dancing across this, that slope was about a mile's worth of trans, transmission towers. So, so there's nothing except some towers and white in this photograph. And I thought that was so cool. Okay. Um, so I was six or seven when that when I saw that. Life went on, and, and I ended up going to university at Queen's in Kingston, Ontario. Um, my original goal was to be a naval architect. Um, in my first year there, a bunch of naval architects that I queried about that prospects, they said, um, it's a lot of fun, but you won't make any money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they were telling me to go away. <laughs> um, so I looked around and said, what am I going to do? That's why I came here. The precursor was mechanical engineering. And a classmate at the time said, well, go do civil engineering. I said, what's that? Yeah. And he, and he points across the street at a new building going up, said, it's that. Steel work going up. So anyway, I, I, I did do that. By the time I finished university, I couldn't imagine doing anything different. <laughs> then, you know, you get out and start doing things. And at about, how does this work? I ended up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, working for Stone & Webster, a big American company, doing you know, a construction management team in the steel plant there. You know, blast furnaces, rolling mills, coke ovens, all that stuff. And um, at some point they said, okay, uh, we're going to ship everybody over to Africa because these guys were going to spend money for a while. And I had just gotten married. I thought, that doesn't sound like a great idea. <laughs> You're out in the desert. Most of the guys did go, and when they came back a year or two later, they never talked about it. So it, yeah. can't, it can't have been much fun. No kidding. Yeah. So a friend at the time said, well, why don't you go work for the power company? Who's that? Um, at Great Lakes Power. And they just in the last couple of years, they got swallowed up by what, Hydro One. Okay. Which is Ontario Hydro. So I, I ended up working there for four and a bit years in the mid 70s, um, 77 on, I guess. And um, I was looking forward to playing with the rivers, kind of like, you know, sailboat design. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fast flowing water. Didn't happen. Uh, first day on the job, I'm standing out in the mud up to my ankles on a thing called a right of way, looking up in the sky, wondering why are there always three wires? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I say, and a career was born. <laughs> So, Perfect. Yeah, that's the, that's the way it's born for most of us too. <laughs> You're right because you don't learn what we know in this engineering part of the business anyway in school. They don't teach it. No, you you learn it on the job. And in fact, what I do remember being told in university structural engineering class was that everything you are going to learn depends upon the fact that deflections of of members of the structure are very small. You know, like the building does not flop in the wind and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, so all the formulas you will learn in school are are based upon things not moving very much. Well, then I get into this business and to a structural engineer in the line business, the wires between the towers are part of the structure. Okay. And in fact, they're the most important part. They're the strongest part because with very rare exception, the wires, if pulled on hard enough, will always break the structure before they break. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, this is something we know uh, and we realize 
just through dealing with it. <laughs> you know, you'd often see cross arms broken or poles broken before you see wire broken. But this is neat to hear. You know, I looked at a failure one years later in Nebraska where uh, the dramatic way to say it is 60 miles of 345 kV K frames, you like fancy H frame, dominoed. And um, the wire was, was broken nowhere. You know, the structures broke, the wires never broke. Now, the shield wire, shield wires broke, but that's why it started to go, things like that. There was, a, there was a break actually about five miles into the 60 miles, and that's because a train came along later and snagged the wire and dragged it a quarter mile down the track. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. So what you learn in this business is that the, if the wires in, in these spans that are, you know, 300 feet to 3,000 feet long, if those wires are st structural components, they are large deflection structural members, completely different set of formulas and rules and ways of thinking than what you were taught at school. So that's why, to me, it, that's a technical explanation to say, this is what you don't learn in school about this business. You have to learn it in an office somewhere. Yeah, um, I'm kidding. Yeah. And you're going to be taught well or not. Yeah. It, and I got lucky because the guy who engineered this line that you want to talk about, um, he's uh, 25 years my senior, I, more or less, and maybe exactly. And uh, he was an excellent teacher, and he loved to teach this business to people. So he taught. He had students of his of his around the world, and I was lucky enough to be one of them. How did that? How did that come about? It was a chance encounter becoming like. Yeah. Him becoming your mentor? Yeah. Yes and no, I suppose. I'm in the business, so 1977, yeah. 78, in Sault Ste. Marie, and a small company. There were like six of us in the engineering office, something like that. Three days after I started, the other civil engineer there who'd been there forever, he was an older guy, he had a heart attack <laughs> and was gone. Now, he didn't die, but he took six months off, and when he came back, he sat quietly at his desk and packed everything up and never did come back to work. So I got into this business and I had zero <laughs> mentoring in the, in the building. Um, in those days, Ontario Hydro was not a competitive thing. You know, deregulation made everybody a competitor. Sure. But in those sure. days, you could call them up and you could ask them questions. They would happily answer, give you guidance. So, you know, I, at the end of the phone, I had some people I could ask questions of. But we also used to send technical papers circulated around the office. That ha I, I went to work on Ontario Hydro afterwards for another five years, over five years in the 80s. And, and there, too, they would pass technical papers that from all over the world that had been written around the various guys. And we, and we had the opportunity to read these things and, and, and you know, soak up some knowledge. And I found that one guy whose writing was pretty elegant and, and, and what he said I, I tended to think was good and good ideas and this and that. So one day, his name was Brian White. And uh, in 1985, I guess they were holding a big conference at the Royal York in Toronto. And I was working up the street by Queens Park on the hydro building. And I, and I decided I'm gonna go down there and listen to this conference, just walk down the street. And he was making a presentation in a room and it was a circus. Because when, when he was in a room where there was a presentation, either he making it or him listening, things happened. <laughs> if, if somebody else was presenting, he always made comments. And his comments were usually aimed at educating the guy who just delivered a, a subject. <laughs> so a, he, he was like a pretty, like, oh, he like was, a guru, like pretty intelligent. He by then, was in the 80s, 30 years after this power line that he engineered, which was his first, um, he'd become a world-renowned person. You could say Brian, and everybody in the world knew who you were talking about in the business. Okay. Anyway, I went up to him and I introduced myself to him. And, and I, I, I said something that endeared me to him forever. Because he, is a, he, had, he, he, had, he passed away at the age of 90, by the way, in 2012. And... and uh, I can say a few things about him now that he won't hear. <laughs> <laughs> he might. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, 
he had a fabulous ego. Um, he loved his accomplishments uh, and he's very proud of what he had done, starting with what we will talk about today. Um, and and he, he actually, his ego, need, all his life, his ego needed to, to be fed by his transmission line engineering uh, abilities, if you like. He lived off of that. And it, was, and it was annoying to a lot of people. And there was a guy who, another colleague in the business, who said after Brian passed away, he said, oh, Brian, he said, I wanted to, I wanted to punch him in the nose every time he got up and talked, but I, but I learned something every time he did. <laughs> <laughs> he was a character. So I introduced myself to him in 85, and we had a relationship loosely for a while. I went job hunting about five years later, 91, and, and uh, I ended up in Idaho with this company, Power Engineers, who it turns out he knows. He knew people here. Um, so my relationship actually grew hard, stronger. And then I think it was that I got there in January. Um, he showed up in March and he had just done something on that power line and he was telling us all about it. And he said, he hadn't been up there for decades, I think, uh, but he had gone up there because they ran into avalanche trouble and he gave them a quick answer. Uh, and he said they got a lot of stuff they want to do up there, and he worked all by himself. He'd been consulting alone forever out of Hudson, Quebec, outside Montreal. And um, he wanted some help, you know, some people who could draft and write and calculate and these things. And so he asked if we were interested. I said, yeah, I'll go. So I, I went up to uh, Kitimat with him. We got in a helicopter, and we flew up onto the Kildala Pass up top there, and we're looking at this stuff. And I look over to the side and I say, that over there is where that photograph was taken that I saw like what, 30 some years earlier. Wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and he said that day, he's looking out over the whole glacier area where this catenary got built and stuff. And you could see way down the Kamano River from there. He said, you can see more good engineering. He's talking about himself, of course. <laughs> More good engineering from right here uh, than anywhere in the world. He's probably right, but what's amazing is he neither one of us had any idea of what was to come in that same spot in the next twenty years. You know. Wow. So, what a, what a what a neat experience though to, to yeah. uh, just for that to pop into your head yeah. in that second and be like, "This yeah. is the picture. That's cool." Yeah, yeah. there wow. it is. Place. <laughs> So let's explain to the listeners what line we're talking about then, um, like location, where it's located, and a little bit about it. Well, Kitimat, B.C. is on the coast, and it's kind of inland. <clears throat> it looks inland from Prince Rupert, which is pretty close to the tip of the southeast Alaska bit that runs down the coast there. Yep. Um, I say it looks inland because there's a long inlet there, um, you're actually 60 miles or something from the open coast, but you know, there's water everywhere coming in through these uh, channels, uh, Douglas Channel, I think it's called. I think you're right, yeah. That's right. And uh, so back in probably the late 40s, I guess, after World War II and the Korean War, I think was on or in the air, um, Alcan was looking for another place to, to make aluminum and, and they were doing it in Quebec at that time. And, and what you need is lots of real cheap electricity. So somebody had figured out, well, if I build some dams on this bunch of waterways, the headwaters of the Fraser River in central BC there, I could make an enormous lake, and they do. It, it's not a big round lake. It's like a big, huge ribbon, a couple hundred kilometers long. Yep. And then they said, well, and then all we got to do is drill a tunnel over to the coast uh, and, and, and put a powerhouse there and then build a line over to Kitimat, and we got ourselves a, an operation. So that, and so they built all that in the front end of the 50s, 1950s. So the, the powerhouse is, um, as I call it, but as the drunken flow, drunken crow flies, <laughs> uh, is 80 miles sort of southeast of Kitimat on another, 
arm of the ocean coming in. Um, so they built a town there called Kamano at the powerhouse. Yeah. And so from the reservoir, they drilled 10 miles uh, horizontally uh, through, the, through this mountain. And then they dropped half a mile down into the powerhouse, which itself is a quarter mile deep inside the mountain. Um, it's got these big James Bondish doors, you know, at the entrance way. <laughs> for sure, for sure. You open them up, it's like, okay, there's a villain in here with a white cat. And and uh, you drive for a quarter mile on a paved road, two-lane paved road to another door. So I can't remember where you put your vehicle. You park it there somewhere. And you open those doors, and, and you're in on the, the generator gallery floor of the power. It's just an enormous floor. Eight, eight generators. Every one of them is a bit over 100 uh, megawatts. And uh, so they, they can generate 800 megs out of that station. Half a mile of, of headwater pressure. And right now they're, they're building, they're drilling a second tunnel because the first tunnel was 65 years old and it's got a few little uh, flaws. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen something similar. I've been in into the one in Churchill Falls in Labrador. Um, I've been down inside to the bottom of that powerhouse and, and been in there. It is amazing to see really yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if we talk about the transmission line, that's pretty cool. And the people in our business get kind of jazzed about it. But when you think about what the the other stuff that people do, you know, that tunneling and, and opening up a cavern in the mountain, building a generating station, like, holy cow. And to do it back in the day that they did it, right? Like, we'll get into talking a bit about the the types of equipment used to build <laughs> the transmission line in itself. I can't imagine what was done to build this, the tunnel. Not just to quibble, but there's the good and the bad too of the timing. Yeah. You you can't do these days environmentally what those people did then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sure. all that, you know. Yeah. In fact, they tried, right? They tried. You go into the powerhouse, and on the one end of it, there's a big cavern also dug where they were going to put in two more generators, bigger ones, and and sort of increase the capacity. It was a KCP project they called it back in the '90s, and. Uh, it got stopped by environmentalist issues. Uh, so you could not keep doing things the way they did it in the 50s. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And we can't either, of course. I, I remember I've been up to uh, up to the top of Kildala, and worked up there a little bit. Now, you see um, every so often when the snow, snow leaves enough, you see like remnants of helicopters and things <laughs> like that where they must have just left them there. Like if they uh, didn't. You know, when they built the line, and there's old photographs of it, um, there was a whole village, in a sense, built up there in the past. I've like, seen that, yeah. There two dozen buildings. And when and when they were done, they burned it. Yeah. They torched everything except two two buildings. So there's a thing called Camp 11 that's left sort of a staff house, hardly ever used. Yeah. And another little shed with a, a, a bulldozer in it, sort of a, what a D7 size thing. Um which I th is up there is I think is trapped there, and it, it will never get used again. <laughs> yeah, if you want a free bulldozer, it's up there. <laughs> you just got to get it down. <laughs> yeah, but when, when I you walk around there as you say, and, and so, oh, there's rusty fragments of steel everywhere, and and burned woods. You guys never cleaned up nothing. <laughs> no, no, there's no reclamation for sure. No, I know this thousand years it'll rot and rust. <laughs> yeah, so. What, how long is this line now? How long between Camano? You said that it's 50 miles, or now they call it 80, 80 kilometers. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say it, you know, it starts out as basically sea level at Camano, the powerhouse. And, and I, I just looked these numbers up a while ago as I was writing stuff for Instagram. But it runs about 15 kilometers alongside the Camano River, rising slightly, I think. At, when it, when Camano River parts ways with the line, you're up like 800, 800 foot elevation, not not very much. But then it it it, it goes up over the mountain, uh, and for another 15 kilometers, and then a drop. And there's a bunch of features along the way there that get important to the stories. But at the end of it, it drops back down to, to low elevation on the backside in the Kildallo river valley and follows that out um all the way to um uh, to kitimat for about 50 kilometers 
uh, most, most of it along flat river valley. And, but there's a modest mountain there called Green Mountain just outside Kitimat, which it goes over slightly and then it crosses the Kitimat River Delta and into the plant. Yep. So, you know, um, from a distance point of view, the majority of the line is alongside rivers and in low elevation valleys and, and has, has uh, slopes on either side of it, you know, like a mile high that, that enjoy throwing avalanches and rock slides at it and the river likes to swell up and drown it once in a while. Um, but the dramatic stuff to me, and, and Adam Chernesky, who looked after the line for all those years, 40 years, says the rivers gave him more trouble than the mountain I bet. over time. Um, but from my point of view, that the mountain has got some amazing stories in itself. I remember the, uh, so I worked on um, a job there right at right near the delta we took two structures and removed removed two lattice steel tower structures and replaced it with those 220 foot yeah yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah. i was a part of building those yeah and then i uh, did a couple other little things with uh with all tech changing out insulators and we had yeah. we had a project going for a number of years there replacing insulators on that line and so years. yeah <laughs> In fact, I had your guys on the phone um, yesterday with this other business, and we said there's still one tower, Tower 115, up on the pass that has not got its insulators changed yet. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they were up there. He said they tried, I'm going to say, in the last couple of weeks or something. Okay. They, they took So they took that line out of service to do it, and something happened. They they they. They tripped the other line, and the, and the plant went off. Oh, that's not <laughs> good. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's never good when that happens. No. They said back in the 90s, they had the same thing happen, similar thing happen. They said that the uh, the pots in the old smelter before they rebuilt it could afford to be cold without without power for four hours, and oh, then wow. then they would freeze up. Uh, and at that time, they said if they freeze up. It's probably not even worth trying to fire them up again. The town's cooked. Imagine that. Your life depends upon a, four, an out, a complete outage lasting less than four hours. Well, they had an outage. It was, a, it was an ice storm. I can't remember what triggered I think it was ice on the transformers down in the plant. And they get kind of carboned up and they shorted out. This and, that. And, and the guys... They worked their tails off to get that thing back on surface, and, and they tweaked this, tweaked that, and they were they were off for six hours and twenty minutes, which means they were two and a bit hours overdue. Yep. yep. People saved the place. They, it's as if that place came that close to being just out of business. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so what, like, we get into talking about the avalanches and the towers up in the pass. But did they not knock off the power? Or they had some sort of backup to. Well, you do have backup from the from BC Hydro coming in. Uh, from the other, okay. Campus. So there's something there, but I I don't know the numbers now. The now the plant is new. I think it's got a bigger electricity draw, sure. it's more, yeah. it, which is weird. It's more dependent than ever on these power lines, which are now older than ever. Yeah. <laughs> so good luck. So. When they were built, they were both both circuits built in the early fifties. Yeah, they, yeah. I I kind of think one led the other a little bit. Yeah, you know, when you're down on those low elevation areas that I mentioned along the rivers, they're standard looking double circuit lattice towers. You know, they look like everything else. Um, they have one saving grace: there's no shield wires. I hate, I hate shield wires. Same. <laughs> they're nothing but inviting trouble. But when when they get Either side of the jump over the mountain, there was a big switching station, which it, where the equipment now is all gone, um, because they could switch from they, they broke it in two separate lines structurally, uh, instead of all six wires on one tower. They you know, each circuit now had its own tower line. The one, the one. So when you're back to Camano, uh, and you're looking along the line, the tower line on the on the right um, is a lattice line. It's sort of a, a squarish looking thing, um, single circuit, flat bridge uh, configuration. And, and the tower's numbers start at number 100 uh, for this arrangement up over the mountain towards command. I think there's probably 130, 140 towers, sorry, 40. 
from 100 on through about 140, something like that. Um, and the line on the right is numbered, you know, like 105 R. Those are okay. those are R towers. And on the left, you have these big tubular aluminum towers. Uh, so the L line is is aluminum too, five leg swing sets. You know, like a big giant kids backyard swing set with a fifth leg down the middle, all on steroids. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is the, this is the line that. I really got intrigued with when somebody started to tell me about it originally, this aluminum structure looks like a swing set and it has like a trap door at the bottom and Mm -hmm. you actually get inside of it and climb up the inside of the leg. Yeah. 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 Some people can't. (laughs) Yeah. I just thought that was kind of neat. Climbing 125 feet in the air inside a little black hole. Inside everyone. And you get within about 10 feet of the top of the leg and there's another hatch door. You go out and you climb an external ladder up onto the top of the box bridge. So a rectangle is probably like 40 inches wide and five, five and a half feet deep, something like that. And, and there's two trap doors on top of that. You can go inside there. So there's either uh, refugees or tools inside the bridges. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it's probably a lot of both. <laughs> No, like if, if people do want to see these, I just Googled Kildala power line and you can see what these structures look like that we're talking about. And you can actually find some of those old photos of them building it in the past and pretty, pretty neat how they built these things too. Like, yeah, I, I need to go get, I, I have, but I left it at the office that I stopped going in Haley, Idaho, where I retired from and now in Boise, but I have a, a little soft covered binders only like a couple dozen pages and it is about those towers and and i don't know why i have it i was given it or i stole it from alcan <laughs> i don't think i stole it but yeah <laughs> you might want it back i don't know i have it and it was all about how to build them oh cool uh, and and why they are what they are that sort of thing you know for example they, they're aluminum because as i understand somebody told me alcan thought well let's design a tower that it's going to be awesome, and then we can sell aluminum all around the world. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> yeah. And these things, they are as strong as can be. They're, they're really tough. Um, and they're, they're in segments about anywhere from, say, 6 to 10, 12 feet long. And there's a weight stencil on every one of them. Uh, and they're all under 1,000 pounds, you know, 800 this, 900 that because that was the lifting capacity of helicopters at the time. Amazing. These things were, and maybe even, well, when they built the thing in the 50s, there was a road end to end. You could drive, switch back here all up and over the pass and on down. You could do all that. Uh, That road now completely gone in places. You can't drive that anymore. I haven't for years. When I was looking up those photos, it, it shows pictures of the helicopters used yeah. as well. And there's that, uh, I forget the name of the helicopter, but it looked like an egg beater. They called it the egg beater. Yeah. Um, an old, they, at that time, I was just doing a little more reading too. Um, when they used that helicopter, it was the first time <laughs> a helicopter had ever been used for construction purposes I in think- Canada. I, I think, and I'll bet you Adam Trinesky can tell you this for sure, because I... He might have it and has shown me. Somebody wrote a book. It's just a small little book. It's it's sort of like the size of a field manual, as I remember, about heavy lift helicopter construction development as it happened on this project back in the 50s. Um, So, yeah, that's that's very true. And apparently it was also... Apparently, it was also the largest helicopter when it flew, it flew into YVR to refuel, which YVR is the Vancouver International Airport, um, was probably the biggest, is the biggest airport on the Western coast in Canada, at least. Yeah. And it, it was the biggest helicopter that that airport had ever seen. And <laughs> this was early 50s. Okay. So amazing, amazing to think about these things. Like, yeah. And then you go and Google a photo of the unit and it's not that big. And that, that was their tools. Like that's what they had to use, right? Lifting capacity of a thousand pounds. Well, especially at that elevation. Yeah. You know, because you're a mile up, you're 5,000 feet there at the pass. Yeah. Yeah. It's 10 years now since I was up there doing this work. 
and I haven't been around helicopters since then, really, uh, not big ones. And, yeah. and um, I can think of an exception, but it doesn't matter. And I was sitting outside t- this morning having a coffee in the beautiful sunshine of the t- today, and I heard this whine. Pum, 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 pum. I, thought, I couldn't see it yet. It was just coming, and it was close. I thought, That's a Chinook. Oh, yeah. And it was, uh, gosh, you don't forget that noise. No. <laughs> oh, that's neat. No, you don't. I I worked with a few, and I'm sure there's a few line guys listening to this that they definitely they know the sound of every helicopter. Like they yeah. could just. I know Chad Hepburn was one of those guys. You, yeah. You'd just be like working with them in a bucket or whatever, and he'd hear blop 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 blop, and he'd be like, "Oh, that's an A star." Exactly. That's a, this I know which which machine it is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Chinook came into our job site. In building the catenary 10 years ago, several times, and he would come up after a day of logging from somewhere, you know, and he'd come rolling up the valley, the, the uh, Kamano River, towards uh, Kamano itself, where they have a big landing pad, and uh, you could hear him for a long way coming, and he's down low, he's only like 100 feet off the ground coming in, and and it just makes the whole valley's air rock. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, the the energy is huge. Especially in the valley, it's pretty cool. Sure. Yeah. 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 So uh walk us through a little bit of the power line as it comes through the valley and then up over the mountain pass, the Caldella Pass and, and down through the bowl and what's kind of special about that. Okay. Well, so let's start from Camano. So people listening need to need to build a map in their head as we go through this. As I said, you go about fifteen kilometers up the up the valley and the rivers um arguing with the power line for space, right? And a few towers are on the wrong side of the river, which is a problem for people. And, but anyway, you, you go 15 kilometers, and then in, in front of you, there, there's a rather large mountain. The, the, the river veers off uh, to the east. They jump the river, and, you, and they go up of about 10 structures or 10 spans worth, uh, up to about 3,000, 3,500 feet uh, in, in about 10 spans. To the to a ridge, uh, which they call Twin Peaks, um, and from that ridge, you then drop down into this glacier bowl, which it, it's a it's a geographic label for a, a, a kind of place, right? It's yeah. like a mountain over the years has been hollowed out by glaciers, and, and now it's got this bowl where snow keeps falling in, and and as you go up. The slope of Twin Peaks, then way down off to your right, will be a, a narrow slot out of the Glacier Bowl where the, where the river out of the bowl runs down into the Camano, you know, so off behind you to the right. So there's a, there's an exit, if you like. Uh, the bowl has not got high sides all around, put it that way. So they, they, the line dropped down onto the floor of the bowl, which I think went back down from, say, I forget the number, 3,500, almost 4,000 feet on the Twin Peaks, two lines up there. If you went up there in the old days, you would wonder, where the heck are we going to put towers? Because <laughs> it's just, it's not a highway. Um, they dropped down onto the bowl floor, and there were three towers on each circuit down on the bowl floor before it hopped up on the, on the north end of the hole uh, to a pair of towers, 114L and 113R, which are paired together. And then it just hopped up one more uh, jump up onto the pass. Couple and that's th- Camp 11 right up there? Camp 11 is right up there on, on the rocks uh, there. Yeah. And from there, it sort of stays on the mountainside for a dozen spans or so. And then it slowly drops down into a, another valley, but it's, it's high. It's up about 2,500 foot elevation called the Hangin Valley, another geographic name. Runs for about 15 spans, 20 spans. And then that, that valley drops like the lip of a milk pitcher down into the Kamano River Valley, and there's a big switch back to get down. So it's a hanging valley because it doesn't blend into the valley below. It just sort of rocks along and then drops, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so the hanging valley and, and the pass and the bowl and Twin Peaks is all considered the mountain, okay? Um, so what happened is they built this line, and there's a photograph I have um, – I, I can't remember why I did this, but about two weeks ago, I started a, um, an Instagram account, which is maybe, I think, what you saw. Yeah. And I, 
for the lack of a better name, the way they like to label things, I call it the Kildala Catenary. And I put a photograph, I, because I saw this photograph, um, it sort of got me saying, now I can start to tell a story because I'd never seen it. In this photograph, you're up on Twin Peaks, it's winter, there's white everywhere, and you can see five of the six towers down on the valley floor. And then on the horizon of, ahead of you is the pass. Um, in that photograph, the conductors are strong on the R line, the lattice line, but they're not yet strong on the aluminum line. They're still sitting there. So that tells me this picture was taken in early, the winter of 53, 54. Wow. Um, because by November 54, they're, they're, it's all wired up. Um, now, Brian White, when he got asked, he was working for the big engineering company um, down in Vancouver who was doing a lot of this development for Alcan up there. And, and the way he says it, the, somebody realized one day, gosh, the, the, the powerhouse and the smelter, they're like 50 miles apart. I guess we need to line. <laughs> I think he's throwing some drama in there, but I, yeah. <laughs> um, so he was 28 years old at working for. He had never designed a power line in his life, and somebody said to him, "Why go go make this power line happen?" Imagine amazing. It. Now I was just thinking about that because I just I, read that on. Yeah, yeah. And now I, I, a week ago I was telling you that I decided. Uh, well, because I put the Instagram page out there, a guy at the Kitimat Sentinel, the paper, called and asked if I could tell this story in the newspaper there. The people up there would love that. And I said, okay. But then I decided I'm going to write it for him, for the magazine. I'm going to write it. It may turn into a small book. To get the whole I would thing. love that. I would love to see that. So it's, I'll get her done. Um, so in the book, I... I because I was working with Brian White so much, I had, he wrote a lot of stuff, and he wrote a lot of his own stories. And so I have those stories now. Now that he's passed away, I have his stories on the computer. And one of his stories is, a, is about this moment where they're engineering this line, and they, and they say, we're going to go down through this bowl, this hole in the ground. And when you're down there, you're looking like you, you're down in the bottom of a coffee cup. You look yeah. straight up at they say the glacier that used to be in, in, in the glacier bowl was much bigger than it is now. It was sort of hanging over your head right above you. And he claims that he and several of his guys on his team were arguing big with the more important people that this is no place to put a power line. In fact, when I was at his house several years ago, he showed me drawings of a profile of putting that line not down in the bowl, but all the way up around the west ridge of the bowl way up top. It's on paper. Yeah. But he's down there with these guys, and, and they had with them a world-renowned uh, soil mechanic, geotechnical guy. Okay? Uh, he's, I don't know where he's living, maybe the U.S., but he's Austrian, Carl Terzaghi. He wrote my textbook for soil mechanics when I was in school. Um, he, so at the time, he would have been, I think, 65 years old. And he's there, world-renowned guru, and he turned to Brian after the, during this argument, he said, young man, if this young man <laughs> can put good foundations here, everything will be fine. Something like that. So Brian lost the argument. <laughs> uh, and the line went down in the hole. And, the, and I rarely, rarely have seen photographs where the towers are down there because it went in service in November and in January, three of them were wiped out. <laughs> Brian was right. <laughs> But Carl Terzaghi was right, too, because his foundations are still there. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And Brian loves telling that story. <laughs> um, so they took out three more structures. So all six structures that were on the floor of the bowl have been gone since 1955. And um, he was told, he, he had since in the, in the most recent months had moved back to Montreal Brian did, and he, he got hauled into the office, and, and they said, um, get back up there and put that line back uh, you know, in place. The implication being, don't screw up again. Yeah. It's your fault this thing fell apart. <laughs> and is that the birth of Catenary One? Yeah. Well, so he, he, he says he was, 
he, this is in his writing that I just I just put it up on my draft book yesterday, but I've seen it many times before. He he said he's in a bar or someplace, you know, with a bunch of people scratching. He said, "What the hell do we do? We can't just put them back. That won't work." And somebody said, "You need a sky hook." Uh... Now there was a rumor. I wasn't sure about this, but I asked. I'm not kidding you. Yesterday afternoon. I had Adam Chernesky on the phone with, with us on this other work with your guys. And I asked him, are you the guy who told Brian White he needs a skyhook? He said, <laughs> he said, yes. So, I mean, the small world of all this, you know, the players are not like standing in a room with you. <laughs> just, just amazing. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It's a, it is a small world, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So, I, I often talk about that on this podcast, just, just how tight it is. Yeah. Uh, of a trade and of an industry. Uh, it's only a couple steps before you know somebody who knows somebody you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. When we were doing the catenary in 07 and 08, um, three of the guys on the Altec crew were the, were the Stewart brothers. Three of the Stewart brothers. Um, Dale, Brian, and Bill. Oh, and Ron was there too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and and uh, I, I found out chatting with Dale over time that he and I have never met, but we've been within 20 miles of each other most of our lives in this business. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, so Brian, as soon as you say to Brian, you just skyhook, he, he, he was really, um, he had two things. He had an amazing uh, imagination, sense of creativity, and, and, and no fear of... Um, step doing something new get, stepping out of bounds and so is his next piece of the story uh, he tells because it defined his entire career which at that moment lay in front of him right because he, he did this for the next 50 years um he proposed this cable across the van you know anchored up on that mountainside over there and anchored up on that mountainside over there those two those two places on each side so he, he had uh, Two cables, and then, and they were brought together near the near the middle over the surface, so that they're brought together. They're hundreds of feet apart at the anchors, but they're brought together over the line to, to three feet apart, and they become a handrail for a catwalk, as you know. Um, so he proposed that, and he's, he said he's at he's at the board of directors meeting for Alcan. I think at that time it was Aluminum Company of Canada, trying to sell, and he's now 30, 32. 32 year old kid who was fixing the power line that he broke in his lines, right? And he's proposing this unheard of idea to these people. And he said, after a long discussion of, you can imagine, old man skepticism and all this, one of the, one of the board members said, well, nobody has told me what's wrong with it. So let's do it. Now, that statement there, Brian says, and he says there's 10 words, he says, just defined his career forever. He was willing to step out of bounds every day after that uh, if, because he didn't believe he was likely going to make mistakes. <laughs> Amazing. I'll tell you one he did make on Cavella Pass. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it went from there. Now, so the avalanche was... January 25 in 1955, and they, the line went back in service, hanging from his catenary, exactly eight months later to the day, September 25. In eight months, they built that. They, they figured out what to do. He told me in recent years that when I was doing this, the other catenary, he said, yeah, but you cheated. You, <laughs> you used a computer. <laughs> No kidding. He's, there's some truth to that, though. Well, he says, you know, I'm sitting in a cabin or a tent someplace doing, you know, log tables by hand, you know, this endless nonsense. And, and it's like, oh, that must have been so tough. And, and it, you know, in a sense, you had something to go off of. Yeah. You know, something to look at and go, okay, there, I have, I have there's one right there. Yeah, I have a lot to go off of, which I'll tell yeah. you. Um, yeah. So he did all that. You couldn't go up there and do anything until May. You know, because the, 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 especially the floor of the bowl, every time I've been up there in the winter, the snow down in the bottom of the bowl is not just nice 
fallen snow. It's stuff that has fallen there and run. Yeah. It's moving snow. That's what's down there. Um, so you can't go there till May or June. So, But when they did get there, they had roads. They could drive there to, to their job site. Yeah. And there were only like months since everything else they had built the line with was still around. So they were well equipped with a certain amount of tools and access was good. So they got these cables. They used a three inch diameter steel rope. And, and when you say steel rope, galvanized steel rope, when you say steel rope, think of a hemp rope where it's like se several windings of, of, of hemp all uh, wound around each other, right? It's not like a conductor where everything is wound around the, the central strand. It's, yeah. it's, it looks like a hemp rope. But it was three, two of them, three inches in diameter. They were in four sections. So from the uh, right side anchors down to, down to the end, uh, beginning of the catwalk, there was a yoke plate. And, and they, they, they made a joint there. You had a section across the, the uh, of cables across the catwalk another yoke plate, and then a longer run up to the east side anchors, and that was broken in, into two pieces. So there's a big um, socket joint halfway along there. So you got these eight chunks of cable that were brought out there, um, wherever from. Um, he had gone to Roebling in New York and done a, a, a model of this thing to try and, and see how, how dynamic it was going to behave in, the, in, in that time frame. So he, he, there's a form, formula for building a model that is physically scaled, scaled by mass and scaled by elasticity. You can do all that. So he did that. Mm -hmm. We ended up doing it later too for, for something else, and it's kind of interesting. Um, they laid all those things out on the floor of the valley and, and you drag the ends up to the end, pin them on one acre, and then they just, you know, um, the multi-purchase system to drag the other end up and pinned it. Um, and actually later today I'm going to post a photograph on Instagram of him standing by one of the east side anchors with the end of the clevis sitting there in front of him ready to be pinned. Really cool. <laughs> he's pretty proud. Um, so they built that thing in eight months. When we went back there in 07 because we had a, got the opportunity to build another the other catenary, um, we worked all that summer to get the line back in service and build some anchors. We worked five months the next summer, and we had to come back in 09 to put it. So, I mean, it, yes, there's two catenaries, but the story behind them is so different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it built differently too, right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. 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 See, he, he, he was building on the ground. Yeah. Right? And, and, he, and some, they had a little trick for when they started to raise it, they had one. They had one of the circuits running, and this was interesting too. That big wire, the uh, the EMU wire, three thousand three hundred sixty-four KC mills. It's like ten limits. <laughs> um, it's like the size of a coke can. Yeah, two two point two nine inches. Yeah, a little over two and a quarter inches. Crazy. And the core, the core inside is almost an inch. Um, so. Um, that was supposed to be a conductor, but it all fell apart. Now, remember, three of the structures that are, were removed were still there. So I think what they did was they jury-rigged a span from up on the face of Twin Peaks, where you jumped off from a high elevation, down to one of these towers. And, and they ran the circuit, at least one of the circuits, maybe both, I'm not sure, um, for the duration of that construction project. But it was over your head, not under you. When we built the second catenary, these op the circuits were operating properly underneath us. Amazing. And, and our rule was, don't drop anything, please. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that wire that they jury rigged with, I'm told, was 4 rot. 300 kV, 4 rot. Wow. <laughs> and they said that stuff was just sort of waving in the wind like a snake with corona. Oh, I bet. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. The stuff you do. How did they? How did they raise that up? They just pull it up with cats, or yeah, I think they must have taken up one end and pinned it, yeah, one anchor, and then just had a big, you know, multi-purpose yeah. um, system to drag it up the other end, probably winching from a machine down on the valley floor, yeah, because on that east side access there's terrible. It's a steep, slippery place. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, they 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 raise it up and they somehow pass it 
has the operating circuits one at a time get above it and, and now the new conductor replacing what was damaged just laying on the ground all calculated to length pinned at the two ends and they just raise it up uh, that catenary is 450 feet above ground uh, amazing yeah so, how high is uh, how high is the one you built well, hey mine's bigger yeah I'm 500 yeah. <laughs> i did that to him one time i said it was so good to do a second catenary while he was still alive because it sort of validated his crazy idea right yeah. Yeah. It, it legitimized it somewhat but i i took a bit of pride and he wouldn't show uh, he wouldn't let me uh, wallow in my pride oh he'd sit there stiff lipped because you know, he's like that i said well mine's higher up the mountain the cables are on average 200 feet longer and it's higher off the ground <laughs> you got them beaten every way that's the best yeah that's the that's the kind of competition or the kind kind of competitive spirit we all get too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. How many structures did you build today? I don't know. I got three or four. Oh, really? I got six. Ed reminds us routinely, for example, that he has he is, uh, erected the two highest elevation towers in Canada. Nice. <laughs> Beating his own record. <laughs> <laughs> is there, is there, uh, do you know, is there other Cantoneers in the world now or are these the only two? That... Uh, yeah, there, there are, but they actually don't compare to these because I, I there's a cable in Hawaii on Oahu that, you know, there's a big steep spine down the middle of that island, right? And, yep. and on the yeah. backside behind Honolulu, somewhere there, um, I haven't really looked at it. I could have. We have LIDAR at one point, apparently. So some of the guys in the office know about this. But it's just, it's just a single cable designed for no ice, obviously, Hawaii. Yeah. And it yeah. holds uh, some 69 wires hopping off that high ridge on the island. There's that. Um, I got a paper which I can't read. It's Russian. Um, there's something in Russia where they they sneak through sort of a hole in a in a mountain someplace. So it's not long span. It's not high off the ground. It's just a cable guiding wires around a rock somehow. Um, but but conceptually, it's, it's this. Um, and then uh, I saw a photograph several years ago. They, fairly recently, they did something in South Africa, and I don't know the size of it, but it's very different. Um, and I, again, I don't think it's going to compare and scale to these ones. Um, they even put crazy. They, I don't think they have a catwalk and stuff like that, for example. But they would put insulators assembly in line in the cable system. It's like really, you want all that crazy stuff in your tension track? I would not do that. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And like you, you'd have to think that. At some point in the life of those insulators, you're going to have to replace them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. But yeah, there are those few. Yeah. So, yeah. And you know, before I forget, we may not come back to it. When Brian was done this, and he and he he's went to work for Alcan for some years after, and then he went into his own consulting business forever after that. But somewhere along the line, he got such a kick out of the catenary, which, by the way, he didn't call a catenary at the time. He called it a cross rope because it was a steel rope across the power line. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. So there, you you know, you I'm sure you've seen at the high, high voltages, 400, 500, 735, there are um, cross rope suspension structures out there. Okay. Two, two masts guide like a tent, cable between them across the top, a bunch of cables there, and, and three insulated strings hanging down in, in between them, right? Yep. Um, so it's a they call it a CRS cross rope suspension, and it only makes sense at these big voltages, really. Um, well, he came up. Brian came up with that. He says, "Well, when I don't have two mountains, <laughs> I could put up two sticks and guide them back." And, and he came, and so those things. Uh, I think the first ones he did, he 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 tucked Bonneville power into about 19 miles of it in Oregon, someplace. Uh, they did it. Hydro-Quebec has 735 stuff coming down from James Bay on crossroads. Uh, Argentina, because he did a lot of work in Argentina down there. So everywhere Brian went, he tried to talk people into these things, and <laughs> it worked a lot. And they're all over South Africa. Those people have, have become the, the mothers of these things. They have 
various incarnations of them. And you go to any any place where there's photographs galore, parla, you will see them. And and um, these came from this catenary. Amazing. Uh, yeah, as an idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Don't, have Don't have mountains. Put up sticks. <laughs> oh, it makes sense though. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, what year did like what spurred uh, Cat Two? Well, um, and how did you get involved with that? Yeah, okay. They so that they had that big avalanche in '55, and they did Cat yeah. didn't solve it, and they now consider that structure. Shortly after, they consider that structure to be the safest structure on the whole transmission line. In the years since. And, uh, they they lost a double circuit tower in the Kazala Valley to a rock slide, I think, came down and shoved it over. And uh, in 1975, an avalanche came down on the slope uh, alongside Twin Peaks from maybe half a mile or a mile up, and and scraped Tower 105L off the face of the Earth. <laughs> Adam put that back. They, and the conductors that got ruined are still laying out there in the bush. Sloppy, yeah, sloppy guy, you know. And I think they didn't. What happened there was the bridge just blew right off the top of the tower because it from the wind. And, and there's only four big bolts and it just tore right through. Amazing. So I've, I've seen the, the wrecked plate and just rip right up, rip the thing right off. So it was hanging down the side of the mountain there with all the wires still attached. <laughs> I think it was a dead end. Um, so one of, in 75, they had that. In 86, I think it was, 85, 86, over in Hangin Valley, they had uh, Tower 125 or 126 wiped out, uh, an L tower again, um, by an avalanche. In 92, Tower 113, which was the first one of the whole I mentioned, on the R line, it got smashed by an avalanche in 92. That's when Brian went up there and, and jury rigged a fancy little structure in its place. Um, in, in March of 92 and in September of 92, I was up there for the first time that, as I was telling you, when I saw this place is where I saw that old photograph. And he showed me his fancy little structure sitting there on Tower 113. It was, it was two, it was, it was a um, shape like, like the symbol pie, you know, two legs and a cross bridge. Um, it was carrying a small line angle, so there's a, 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 a cable brace between the two legs, top down to the bottom, one to the bottom of the other. Um, he built that tiny little thing. The legs were only 60 feet long, so it was quite small. But he did that because it was winter, and they wanted to get back in service fast, and now 6,000 pounds was the lift capacity of the available helicopter, the S-61. Yep. So they built 6,000-pound 6, legs. And six thousand pound bridge and bing 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 three parts it's up, so he got them back in service in fairly short order with that thing. The weird part is it's hinged at the bottom. It's in other words, it will fall over, except the wires, the weight of the wires hold it up. Oh wow! Picture that. Yeah. <laughs> he came to our line conference in March right after he finished that. He was just so proud and thrilled by his work, and he talked about that. But he also talked about what happens to a transmission line when you go up over a mountain and you get rye mice loading up the cables up there. It, it, it makes the, you know, puts a lot of weight on the wires and the tension goes up. And if you've got a suspension tower there at the brink, of, you know, the, at the edge of the hill and the, and the span above that uh, suspension tower is loaded, you'll swing the insulators, they'll get pulled into that iced up span and that tower will be tugged uphill yeah. towards the iced up span. So I said to him after the conference that day, I said, what's going to happen to your little hinged tower when that span, which rises 500 feet to the next structure, ices up? And Brian did what he always does when you say something that kind of scares him. He, <laughs> said, he said nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the only time in his life. No, I, I said a similar thing to him once years later, and he said nothing. <laughs> um, the next morning, we were driving back to our line conference, and, and um, he said, boy, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> you hadn't thought of that? <laughs> and in October, that, 
that year, so six months later, I got a phone call uh, from Alcan. Uh, a guy named Dave Dollywall was the engineer and power ops there in Kitimat at the smelter. And he said, uh, Brian's structure fell down. Uh, do you know where he is? <laughs> I did know where he was by some fluke. He was in Argentina or something. And I said, I told him, I said, uh, you need some help. Let me know. Come up. He said, yeah, come on up. So I ended up up there in Kinemad and out at Camp 1 on the power line for off and on for weeks at a time. As we um, cleaned up that mess, his tower fell uphill and it had all kinds of detailing problems, which he was immune to understanding. He was a big concept guy. Uh, but, you know, in, in concept, that hinge structure is a wonderful idea if you have regular size spans either side that can't feed all that wire to let it fall down. Yeah. Span down to the, to the catenary from there was a half a mile. You know, it was a huge span. And it was hanging at the far end from insulator strings that were about 25 feet long. Yep. So, and the span after that was 4,000 feet. So it could feed all kinds. There was, he wrote, so I investigated in detail why this thing fell over and we decided what to put up. So some big shot in Montreal said, well, the first tower lasts 38 years. So let's put that back up. So none of us thought that was a great idea, but we did it because he's the boss. So we got a, another tower made, I think, in Montreal. And uh, we put up a tower just like, like the first one. Um, and during the course of investigating this, I saw, I saw a letter that Brian wrote in the interim in July, in the middle of that year. We said, well, this, if, we, if the span's ice up up top there, this tower, get this, will we'll rotate 45 degrees uphill. And when this is gone, it will go back. <laughs> That's why it was a hinging tower. I had no reason to spend time to argue with it, and, you know, judge whether I would agree or not. So, okay, uh, but now, now that the thing fell over, I had reason to look at that statement and say. So, what I did five or six years later at our line conference, which we've been holding every year, I built a scale model, one of these elastic scaled weight accurate models of this set group of spans. It was, a, it, was a, it was on the front of the room, 150 people in the room. It was on the front of the room, 25 feet long, 30 feet long, big long span from the imaginary catenary down there by the floor, rising up, I don't know, 1,000 feet or something like that too, to his little structure, which in the scale model was, I made it out of little pencils or something. It was about two inches high <laughs> in, in this model. And then it rose up again to the next structure. Um, and I... I took little weights of you know, jury with, with paper clips and I hung them on the upper span to mimic ice and it was all scaled enough. Like, and that thing flopped over when we got one pound of ice up there. So his yeah. 10 pounds was just plain wrong. Yeah. Because he liked to simplify things a lot. You know, I don't, he didn't enjoy the details much. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's nice to just take something and simplify it right down to a simple scale, you know, yeah. just a couple pencils. This is what it would look like. And but sometimes, he, yeah. He had argued for all these years in between that the reason it fell over was, was that the armor grip, um, the, the, the clamp was loose and let go. Oh, you know, come on. Words, you could lean, no, you're water skiing, right? And, and, yeah. and, and the cable, rope will slack and, and you let go with one hand, you're likely going to fall over, right? So that he blamed that. Yeah, that sounds like an engineer blaming on the lineman. Well, didn't, didn't do up the clamp. Oh, it wasn't the <laughs> lineman. No, no, you get to blame the engineer. I'm just, because what I'm just kidding. The armor rods on the original line are are straight and they're wound on with that, that great big like the, the yeah. diamond. Yeah. You know? yeah. And there were 15, 15 rods around the conductor. Now it's 1992 or three, and so we ordered armor rods and we got pre preformed ones. Yeah. And didn't get any thought, but there's 16 of them. They're slightly smaller diameter. Gotcha. Right? So they well, and, and these saddle clamps that they go into, they're about 32 inches long, weigh about 40 pounds. And they're cast they're cast aluminum. They're not machined. <laughs> so 
the diameters inside them did vary a little bit. So it did let go. But the thing had already fallen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on its way. Yeah. So when I did this little model saying, no, this thing fell over at one pound, because I had done a calculation that it would fall over at one or two. It fell over at one. It was more sensitive than even I had figured out. I did that presentation with him sitting in the front row. And I waited six or seven years to do this. I didn't have the guts to, to do this and for years. <laughs> Finally, I did it in front of him. He took it graciously and kept blaming the armor rod. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so there we are. Um, there was an avalanche that wiped out the first tower. Then there was a windstorm rough night, not an avalanche, to wipe out his tower. We put up a new tower like the first one because the guy said it'll last 38 years. Well, 13 years later, 2007, I got a phone call. The tower's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite make the 38. <laughs> and I happened to be on a job walk down in, in California near Los Angeles when I got that phone call. Or, or I was headed that way. And said, can you come up? And uh, I said, yeah, but I have to do this job walk. Can I be there like in two or three days? He said, yeah. So I went and did a job walk. And this is a story about people, the connections, right? Yeah. In several ways. I go on this job walk. And the guy down there that we're walking with is Dean Gaynor, who I think everybody in BC probably knows. He, uh, he's from BC and, he, and his career was, was it PAR? The whole, the whole, uh, Quanta organization. Yep. And so I had him and I said, I'm going to go up to, to BC. And this is when I find, I, I don't remember having met him before that day. Um, it's got to go up to BC and oh, I'm from BC and, uh, and do this thing. And they're going to ask me, what contractor should we get? And Dean said, Alltech, get Alltech because they're a Quanta company. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that's why he said it. And I liked the idea because I knew if they're a quanta company and they need some crazy equipment to go up on that mountain to do something, the quanta's got that equipment somewhere. Yep, for sure. And they did. It was in Montana. <laughs> they ended up giving us the oldest junkiest crap they had. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that I just went, makes the story better, though. Yeah. So I went up there that couple of days later, and, and somewhere in the conversation, I'm sitting in a room which I hadn't been in in about close to 10 years and had been sadly wishing I could get there. Well, now I was. And nobody in the room was somebody I knew. You know, the, all the people in those 10 years had changed. And I said, how did, how did you get my name? You know, why did you call me? I said, well, when we had our meeting yesterday, um, there was a guy in the room that, that knows you who doesn't work there anymore. This Dave Dallywall that I mentioned to you, he happened to be in the room from Vancouver that day. And they're saying, who do we talk to? And he said, call Peter Cashful. Amazing. Now, so I got, so that became, you know, started out, can we build a catner here? And the answer was yes. And But the only reason I got to do that was because a guy that I had done work for 10 years earlier happened to be in the room. And LTech got the job, maybe because they would have earned it, but because I happened to be with a guy in California who said, use them. Amazing. Yeah. I love those things. You know, the, the that, that, yeah. Yeah, that's really neat. I, that's that's the whole reason for this, even this podcast, is just sharing stories like this. And that's really neat. Yeah. yeah. And when we got, I, I probably went to a couple meetings up there at that time, and at some time it, it, it got... Somebody said, okay, let's build a catenary. And just like, I damn near wet my pants with excitement. You know, this is, <laughs> I get to do one of these things. I, I phoned a, a wire rope industries in Montreal uh, while I was at the Vancouver airport coming home and, and said, I need cables. <laughs> and, and I ordered cables, a production spot. Yeah. Yes, I had already figured out what cables I wanted by that time. I didn't know the length, but I knew roughly. Like, how, where do you? What do? You, how do you start with that? Like, you start at foundations, or like, what do you like? What's your process for starting a project like that? Well, I I did have the benefit of of hanging around Brian enough and being up there enough to I knew what Cat One was about. 
Well, it wasn't called Cat One at the time because sure. it was called Black Catenary. So I, geez, what am I going to call this second one? So I thought, well, that's the white cat. We'll call this the black cat. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be just one and two. <laughs> but what I had done in the interim, in the, in, the, in the years since my first visit there and studying his failed little H thing, was the power ops manager was trying to be real proactive. And so he, we looked at a bunch of things up and down the line. So we went in the Hanging Valley where they had lost that tower in 86. And we put on paper, we designed a catenary for there. In, in pretty good detail, how does okay. something work? I knew it would never get built. Um, I still have stuff here if they want it, but <laughs> they may not. Uh, it was going even bigger. <laughs> it was, I get this right, it was, it was well over 5,000 feet across the valley. Oh, man, wow. The, the, the catwalk, the two circuits were quite far apart, so I had two, two separate catwalks short ones at each circuit, just so you can go and walk around and look at the insulator strings and things like that. And it was a 900 feet in the air. And, wow. and, I, and there was something like 11 towers on the valley floor that could be removed with this thing. Amazing. I'd say it's amazing why they don't actually build more of these in places. That, that seems phenomenal. Let's take Man. out 11 spans and You're essentially... Doing- yeah, when we were doing Cat 2, one of the river, run of the river outfits there in, in BC came up and looked at it and they said, we'd like to show you where we want to build a power line down through, down through their cells, you know, opposite, um, in, be, uh, in behind uh, Vancouver Island there, just south of Waddington. And uh, so we went up there and we did a bunch of work there. And um, I'm getting ahead of the story here, but. One day I was flying up in the helicopter to look at this stuff with those people. I had a young guy with me, the guy who I had co-authored this, this book I ended up doing with or for Brian. Um, he's in the front seat, and, we're, and the guy says, take a shortcut to wherever we were going. So we go up this valley, and it was, the valley was shaped like a U, just had almost vertical sides up a 1,000, 2,000 feet, and then more mountain back after that. He turns around, his eyes are wide open like an owl, and I knew what he was thinking. This valley is perfect for catenaries, and it's a shortcut. (laughs) Perfect. We ended up uh, conceptually designing a series of catenaries for those people there. I'm going to get this wrong. I think we we went – I'll make up some numbers, but I'm close. We went 7 or 11 miles – down this valley from a high-end jump-off place with seven or or eight or nine or 11 catenaries in a row. Just catenaries. We never touched the the valley floor for miles. Oh, that would be amazing to actually see. uh, Yeah. We've got in one of those those, uh, KMZ videos on Google Earth. You can can actually fly down our our, our concept. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, and we had other catenaries in other parts of this line too, because th- those mountains there are crazy. Yeah. Um, so back to you what, should put that uh, side note. You should put that KMZ file or video on your Instagram page. Yeah, I'll, I'll get just to just as a visual for people when you get there. That'd yeah. be neat to see. Yeah. Um, and by then we had just finished Cat Two, so we had all kinds of ideas on how to do things better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Because that, the the price of that thing sounds crazy, but we said, well, we can get into mass production here <laughs> and do things simpler. In other words, also, I think you only need one cable; you don't need two. Right. He Brian X'd his because he didn't know if it was going to wander around a lot out there. And when you look at that scaled model where the stiffness and the weight is 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 scaled, the catenary is so much heavier itself than the wires it's holding up. Yeah. That that is not going anywhere. So one one cable is all you need. You don't need two. Well, as soon as you say that, your your labor's cut in half. Yeah. Or more. So things like that. So when I engineered this thing on paper for the Hanging Valley, again, how do we build it? There's circuits operating there, and, it, and so we were going to feed wires up from the valley floor off of reels, and you know to a, to a first cable hanging up, and sort of wheel them on out to an anchor, and you know suck them up that. <laughs> 
well, you can't do that with three inch diameter cables or four inch or whatever this thing was going to need. And that's when I got the idea. Well, if a steel rope is made up of a central winding and then six other ones around it, right? Like when you take a, a coin, you can put six other coins around it perfectly. Yep. In a, you know, in a conductor, every layer of aluminum has six more wires, right? So it was at that time in the 80s that I came up with the idea of I can build a big cable in place, kind of like they do a suspension bridge. And so, that for that, so that's what we did at CAT2 as well, because now the roads are all gone. And the only way to our job site, which was literally at 6,000 feet uh, from sea level, 12 miles away, um, was by helicopter. Everything, sandwiches for lunch yeah. and, and, and bulldozers, whatever. I had to go up there by helicopter. Yep. And, and um, so that was... I, I, I've seen some some photos of that and some video of that flying in the the yeah. snowcat. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so neat. Yeah. Just like, oh, we need a snowcat. Oh, just fly one in. That's right. Yeah. There was an old snowcat that they had at the, one of these funky look Tucker. Is that, what, is that a Tucker machine? It, it sounds about right. Yeah. yeah, and four four tracks, two front, two back. They had one of those in Camano back in the nineties, and we wanted that up there somewhere. So they had the sixty one available for that. So they, they took off tracks, I think, and they took off fuel. They, took, they stripped of everything. Yeah. It's, and it, they said it still weighs 6,000 pounds. And they picked that thing up and, and flew it 20 miles up onto the pass. Amazing. <laughs> and the, 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 the machine landed the helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Once you started to drop it, there was no stopping the drop. You know, oh, we're putting it here, I guess. You know, so, so I got the idea years before like uh, in the mid 90s on building a, cable, a big cable out of small cables so when it came to cat 2 that idea was already there um, for some reason i wanted continuous cable well, i had to build it not on the valley floor but i had to build it overhead of, of, of operating lines right um, and so okay we're on the one side the top of the mountain is a pretty big flat area i mean you can put a football field up there on the other side there was nothing it was just a slope forever. Um, so everything was going to land and be launched and, and, and so on from the one side. So we put everything up there. And the other reason to make small cables was you, need, you needed the tension of each one that you pulled tight to be low enough for a machine that the helicopter could lift to get done. Yeah. I, you know, if I wanted a 20,000 pound machine, well, a helicopter can't lift it. That kind of thing, you know. Um, so we, we chopped it all up in that way. But the, all the wires were continuous length, no yoke plate out in the middle, which which has tension going through it. And this yeah. thing, the tension just follows the wire anchor to anchor. Um, so, uh, and we did it in pairs. There was a two, seven, two. So you, you take a three-quarter inch cable and you, you pack six around one, now you've got a cable that's two and a quarter inches in diameter, but the other layers are parallel, they're not wound. Okay. And, yep. and so we did two of these, uh, seven and seven from one anchorage, uh, diagonally across to the far one, and, and then did it again, uh, two more big cables made of seven each, uh, crossing it over to the other anchor. So we had a, a big X out there. Um, made up of 28 cables, you know, like 28 reels of three quarter inch stuff went up there. You know, one group of stuff was uh, 3,700 feet long and the other ones were 4,300. How, uh, how big is the span again? How long was that span? They, one, one group is, is a little longer than the other, but they average almost exactly 4,000 feet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they cross out there and, and, and now we want to uh, bring them together. Uh, but they're in pairs, and and uh, which means when you when you bring two pairs together, the two inner ones have to cross, you know, to get to the outside. Yeah. And it's like I kind of left that up to the guys. <laughs> you, you figure that one out. I don't know how. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. I, I'll I'll put up a photograph someday. There. They, they were out there on carts on this pair of cables. I've got that on the Alltech Instagram page. Uh, I have that photo. This photograph of, of Bill Stewart strapped yeah. two strain boards. 
um, yeah. other guys behind them. And that's right. And you look at the, all the crap behind them to hold those cables together because they had been pulled from 200 feet apart to where they were there. In the fog, too. It looked like they're inside a yeah. ping pong ball. Yeah. yeah. So those guys were up there sometimes when the fog would come in. And so everybody had a phone with them or a phone a camera of some sort, you know. So we have some awesome photographs that the guys took. Yeah. Um, thousands of them. Um, What's happening on every job these days? I would love to grab some more of those because we've just got a limited few uh, yeah. in, in our stock. So we'll have uh, to grab some of those yeah. for you. Um, there's a, a public relations guy uh, for Alcan at the time. He's still around. Um, McGee. Dwight. Dwight McGee, yeah. He looked at that photograph and said, oh, we can't publish that. <laughs> and he was serious. He, he's not around anymore. Uh, he's, I, he's around, but he's, I see him on Facebook, but he, he's around, but I don't think he's working there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and uh, so why not, Dwight? And he said, well, the guy's not wearing safety glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's an it's education. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 500 feet in the air, yeah. out in the middle of nowhere, thousands yeah. feet from land out the cable, more thousands of pounds of tension, yeah. like <laughs> straddling two boards. Yeah, <laughs> you better get those glasses on. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, so that's how the catenary came about, and and, and we built it in, in that way, just because of the, I say, the. What's going on? You know, you had an operating circuit you could not afford to shut off. Yeah. And, and we, and at the end of the day, you know, on a typical transmission line project, the cost of the labor, the cost of the doing is roughly equal to the cost of material that you're standing up. You know, it could be 60, 40, 40, 60, but let's call it 50, 50. Sure. sure. This project here, when you're done, was one part material 12 parts doing yeah so it didn't matter what you bought <laughs> it only had to make the doing easier <laughs> yeah it was yeah. all in the work getting done yeah yeah, yeah. helicopter one day the Chinook came in to do some work move some stuff from one place to another it wasn't the first first time he was there he, in one day I, I this is written down someplace he did like 24 trips onto the mountain and i and putting 124 tons of stuff up there, something like that, from 12 miles away, a 25-mile round trip, back and back and back and back. And those Chinooks, I've heard, I don't know the price off the top of my head, but I've uh, heard they're, they're exactly. not cheap. No, he came back for another trip, and he just had a couple hours work to do one day. He arrived at thundering into the valley, as we said, uh, 5 p.m. one day, too late to do any work. So he sets down. We wake up the next morning, and as happened a lot, it's raining. And the whole day was socked in. He got to do the work on the next day, and then he, he flew after a couple hours. Well, this is 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and he cost 13 5 an hour. Um, we supplied fuel. <laughs> and, and his minimum time was four hours, typically, right? So we paid four hours time Thirteen half thousand was that twenty fifty four fifty two thousand dollars that rain day to watch him just sit there. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, that's all part of it. Not only that, they said when the year before when the thing was out of service because the next time the avalanche came and hit that second tower, it was a different kind of avalanche than hit the first one. The first one was a powder avalanche that came down from above and hit a gully beside it, and just, just the, the air blast just crushed the tower. It's hard to imagine what it did. And so there, it was all just laying there, crumpled on site, falling uphill, of course, plugging <laughs> 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 it up there. Um, and the next time, this, this tower, um, the avalanche was not a powder avalanche. It was a wet avalanche. And it came down from more or less the same place. But it left nothing. The entire tower was gone, scraped off at the anchor bolts. And, and they never really looked for it, but you could see remnants of it three miles away down by the river. 
got shot right out through that entire shoot out of the out of the glacier bowl. I've heard that described too, and it's, it's quite. I've heard that was quite the sight to see. Yeah. Yeah. So it's gone, and and uh, the two outer phases, the insulators were just suspension, and they snapped off, and they were so it's all there. The center phase was tangled up in the middle window of the tower, and so it got torn. It this wire, uh, the breaking strength, one hundred thirty five thousand pounds, <laughs> and it. It tore it, and the, this, I forget the, how many tons of steel are in that tower, but it's not small, and it went down the valley, mixed up in this mountain of moving snow, so it's like, you know, a mountain of concrete, yeah. really, traveling down there, and when you stand there, you can look, and it would sort of head off to the right, and, and it went underneath the old catenary, the only catenary at that moment, <laughs> it went underneath it, um, and the middle phase, which is now locked up in this block of stuff that's moving, um, it, it eventually tightened up. You know, it, it grabbed hold, um, and it pulled the whole catenary downhill. It it um, it did a lot of warping and damage to the to the catwalk because it, the 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 insulators are hanging from a yoke plate system that straddles the catwalk. So when it swings you know, back and forth, a header back online, it's going to bang into the catwalk. Um, we smartened up on Cat 2. We put slots nice. in the catwalk. So when you walk the catwalk, you have to step over. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing can swing and not wreck the catwalk. So it had torn up the catwalk. But not only that, when it pulled it downhill, it loosened the spans 4,000 feet back to Twin Peaks. To the point where the this is this has to be what happened, but it's hard to imagine. I don't know how high those things are off the ground when things are all kosher, but let's say somewhere between fifty and hundred feet. But one of the phases, I think, it was the outer phase closest to high ground. It must have got down, you know, with the moving of the catenary, it sagged way down, and it got tangled up in the steel and shit of the moving mountain. And, a, and about 400 feet of that phase wire had, the, there's four layers of aluminum on this thing. The top two layers were scraped back for 400 feet. A big wad of, you know, spaghetti back Just there. Just a mess. Yeah. Brains. Yeah. Oh, wadded up back there, about 40 feet wad of the stuff. They operated that line for the whole rebuild session. The other circuit's gone. So they're on one circuit, the L circuit. And they operated that circuit with two layers of aluminum missing for four months. <laughs> it's now as big as Falcon Conductor, the two inner layers. Amazing. <laughs> it's a big wire. Right? Um, yeah, so it took, a, it took one week short of four months to get them back, the second circuit, back in service. And when one circuit is off, the system rules from BC Hydro, you have to curtail generation. Yeah. They can't take that big a hit should something now go wrong with that circuit. So they were they were um, held back from selling power uh, to BC Hydro, which is their norm. They didn't they weren't using all of it in the smelter. And and the cost, the lost power revenue in those nearly four months was ten times the cost of building the catenary. Oh wow! As expensive as the catenary was. Amazing. And so the cat, it was like a no-brainer, including the fact that the insurance company, I said, we're tired of this stuff falling down up there. You need to do something different. Yeah. Which is part of the incentive for a cat. Well, the cat is different for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we now have two best structures out there. Nice. <laughs> but they are, they are the only circuits, the only structures on the mountain where both circuits are dependent on one structure. So yeah. that, that's a scary notion. But there's, they're so secure. Like, the way the design rules for that whole line were in the beginning, we tried to keep that on this. And they say it in a funny way compared to the way we do now. These days, if you build a power line, you know, in Vancouver someplace, you know, it'll be designed, it'll be designed to carry like one or two inches of ice. Sure. Sorry, one inch of ice, maybe more. But it'll be like one or two pounds per foot. We don't express it in pounds, but you could. Okay. But it'd be a number like that. Well, over this mountain, the number is 40. Wow. That line is designed for 40 pounds 
of of weight. But if that, per foot. Per foot. Now that includes the wire itself, which itself weighs five, almost yeah. five. So, but it's an extraordinary number. Right. And now it's never, I don't think they've ever seen that. We think we saw when that structure got knocked over, his hinge structure fell. There was ice up there, and we think we might have had 10 pounds a foot at that time of rime ice on the pass. Amazing. But that's that's the most up there that anybody can point to. What was the size of the wire again? The Amy wire is 2.29, two and a quarter inches. A little bigger than that. And roughly five pounds a foot. 4.76, yeah. four and a quarter pounds a foot. Yeah. And it was 15 kilometers of that? Yeah. 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 It's especially made just for this project too, right? It's not in the books. Yeah. And and I and they made it themselves because they're they did that at the time. Yeah. I don't know if they've ever sold it to anybody else. Um, I, I do believe there's a reel or two laying around out there getting mossy, but <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. Big stuff. Oh, that's so neat. Yeah. Wow. It, so it's eleven years old now and really yeah. had no no issues. No, as far as- no, we, we, we gave them a maintenance plan, you know, go look at a whole list of things every year for the yeah. first couple of years. Because, you know, it's kind of said that when, when you when you build a transmission line, if something's going to go wrong, it's probably going to go wrong in the first year or so. Uh, seems seem to be true. So watch it closely for several years. And then that five years back off a bit, 10 years, I can't remember what exactly we said, but they're now at... They're, they're calling this the 10-year inspection. We put a caveat on it saying, if you see th- something wrong, fix it. Yeah. Worst, and, and bring it, you know, get it perfected, if you like, back in place. Um, there were some things that went on, but they didn't, they didn't fix it. <laughs> um, but you know, they're, they're, they're trivial matters, really. Mm-hmm. But I think what they're doing now is they're, is they're on the brink of giving them a really good look over it. They want to x-ray some of the cables and, and pull the anchors and all, all these things so that they can walk away and not worry about it for five or ten years. Yeah. And then we said, when they get to be 40, 50 years old, go back to a, a more stricter plan. You know, this thing's now an old lady, right? You know, <laughs> might need some care. Wow. Yeah. I, it's a great story, um, Peter. And uh, thanks for sharing it. Yeah, you're um, is there uh, is there anything else you wanted to kind of touch on before we wrap it up? Another story or two that you wanted to share about this? I don't know. I think we kind of hit the highlights of all that. Um, you know, the other thing I said about building the catenary was, and, and this will be good for your your guys. You go on a, an engineer goes on a project, any project, and and you can there, there's a there's an energy in the air which is a distrust, a dislike, or whatever, between the field guys, you know, you guys and my guys. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and if you're lucky, and you have to probably put some effort into it, you, you sort of earn their respect and their trust. And, and I tried to say to my guys over the years you know, that I work with here that that's a really important thing to do. You can't be just a nerd in the office and get out in the field and be that nerd in the field and, and, and go and leave. You've got a job to do because I know things about power lines that you guys don't. And you guys know things about power lines that I don't. And you put your heads together like we did on that catenary. Um, you, you really do some much better stuff. And it's, it feels so much better for those guys to come around at some point and, and, and declare respect for <laughs> your role in the whole thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and my respect for them was huge. Those guys were genetically programmed with safety in mind. They just, you didn't worry about them. They just knew how to do it yeah. safely, yeah. you know? And there, I think one guy stepped off a rock one day and sort of hurt his ankle a bit, but that was like, the end of it, <laughs> you know. Pretty, pretty minor considering the circumstances, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think what you're saying there about the relationship between engineers and linemen, it's it's something that's an age-old, like, uh, relationship that's always needed nurturing and, yeah. and, and a mediator or something. Yeah. 
but yeah. it is it is important and I've, I've tried to say it in other podcasts that it's a it's a good thing to to take that into consideration and to really nurture that relationship yeah. and build upon it because like you said about you each have a very important role in the project in what you're building yeah. and it's going to be a better project overall if you can come together as a team oh, and yeah. understand yeah. each other's role in it so yeah, no, I appreciate what you said yeah. contractually the, the Alltech guys it was, a, it was a team sort of handpicked and created by Fred Hogman yeah. um, and they he did good yeah. <laughs> great yeah. guys yeah. to put up there um, but the collaboration that we, we we got into fairly early on was just so good, you know. I had to write up a plan for the owner, who turned it turned into a, a good friend. You, you might even know him, John Rilkoff. Yep, yeah, I know John. Yeah, because he worked for you guys for a while and went over to Rockstad and stuff yep. like that. Retired a year ago. Yep, I haven't chatted with him since this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he he contracted all tech directly to Alcan, and he contracted us, the engineer, directly to Alcan. But he said, but I want you to operate as if they're contracted to you, you know, like an EPC kind of thing. Yeah. And so we ran it that way. And he, and he was there as a, very much as a partner the whole time. Um, first person I called for my team was Adam, because he knows everything. Um, and it, as, as awesome as it is to describe what we built, the, the most beautiful, rewarding part of the whole thing was that whole people story uh, yeah. that went on. Yeah. And then years later, Chad was up there the, the last year when we all we do was raise the last circuit and drop the last tower. Um, he, you know, he since then has called me for a bunch of stuff up on um, uh, Bruce Jack and ILM, yeah. these things, you know, and he won't, he wouldn't have done that. Yeah. If we hadn't if he hadn't been there and seen how we were working with the guys and it's it's all about just showing them respect for what they know from my point of view uh, I, those guys just knew their stuff the you human know? the human factor is the most important part you know and it is the relationships you build along the way that make it what it is no matter what team you're playing on you know it's yeah still a human on the other side of it and the relationship you built with that person that helps you get along in your career yeah yeah no, there weren't days when they didn't roll their eyes at me yeah well, that's part that's part of it too <laughs> they even curse me under their breath <laughs> it's like yeah. you go out the next day and say okay yeah i i had written this long-winded plan of pages and pages step by step day by day and it was put on a schedule a day by day schedule that assumed no rain no, no downtime for not just rain, but clouds, whatever. Um, and then that's the way the schedule was written. And then we assumed, well, we'll probably get a third of our time will be down. Um, it turned out to be 50%. It was a terrible summer in 08. But when you subtract it out, all those off days, half days, whatever, however I did it, those guys stayed on my plan <laughs> to the day, the whole time. It was brilliant. And... and and I said, anytime you got something that can be better, tell me, you know, because yeah, yeah. I don't know everything, obviously, you know. And But little things like, you're going to cross those cables? I'm going to turn around and look the other way because I have no idea how you're going to do that. But there it was. Yeah. Yeah, the guys are miracle workers in a lot of ways up there. Yeah, no, it's, re it's a really neat story. So you were saying that you're going to put this story in a book. Yeah. Well, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, I, I saw this photograph or two, and I said, I got a whole lot of stuff about this, you know, because there's so much extraordinary stuff up there, including having that transmission line define careers. Brian White got defined by it. I got defined by it much later. I was so thankful I was 58 when I was doing mine instead of 30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would, I'd be chasing rainbows for decades <laughs> after no kidding. 40 <laughs> years left of a career. <laughs> I did drag some young guys up there. I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, but there's so much happened up there. And, and it's like saying there's such weird stuff up there. That it's if I don't write down, you know, Brian's gone and then Adam's still around, but he's been saying he's going to write a book of his story there, but he hasn't done it yet. 
And I want I want to talk to him. Um, if I don't, I'm the only guy left who knows a whole lot about this transmission line, as far as I know. I said, if I don't write it down, nobody's going to know why these things are there yeah. and why they are what they are. Why, why, why things are where they are. Um, so, so that's why I'm going to do it. It started out as this Instagram thing, and the guy from the paper up there wanted an article. And then I said, I don't write an article. I'm going to, I'm, I write the whole story, and then you pick it apart however you like. Yeah. I suspect it will turn into a modest sized little book. Yeah. Lots of, well, lots of pictures. <laughs> well, you just let, you just let me know. We'll keep in touch and I'll, pr I'll promote that book for sure. That's again. And one of the reasons for the podcast is it's just a modern way to tell our stories and get them into the ear holes of yeah. guys who need to hear this people that need to hear these things. It's what, it's what's fleeting uh, or leaving our trade is these stories. Like if you look at the books written uh, about line work, there's not a lot of, you know, not a lot out there about electrical yeah. industry in itself. Yeah. There's a few, the American linemen's a pretty neat book, a chronological history of electricity and line work. And, but other than that, there's not much out there. It's amazing. I just, I got a call from people I, I know conductor company. He said they put their wire up um, in, a, in a place in California, and there's no wind. There's nothing happening, but it's vibrating. And the owner, the utility, is saying, "What the hell?" And um, <laughs> <laughs> can can you can you help us out? I said, "Yeah." And and, and here's where I'll start. You're telling me where that line is. We've had a guy in our office here for who for 25 years has been talking about another line right there in that valley doing the same thing, who says when he was looking at that line, and he's been watching it for 25 years, construction guy said, oh, there's a 500 line over there hopping right out of the shivs when we're building it on a 8 o'clock in the morning when there's no wind. It's, it's like a Bermuda Triangle of vibration there. Yeah. So I said, go ask the utility who – who did, or maybe still do, own that line that's been vibrating for 25 years, if they know that. And I, just an hour before this call here, I talked to this guy, and the utility doesn't know that. It's all young people. Amazing. And they know there are other lines out there doing the same thing. In other words, it's not your product that yeah. is the problem. Yeah. It's what you want to hear. Yeah. So. Isn't that neat, though? Like yeah. And that's what's that's what's leaving. Like these stories are leaving with the people that leave, and yeah. they're not getting told. They're not getting passed down. And that's and really, good. that's what uh, that's what a power line apprenticeship is. It's it's the passing down of knowledge and the ways of doing things from the people the from the people before you. Stories. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been awesome. And your Instagram page is, what is it again? The Caldella Catenary. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure I put that up on my page. I'm going to build a nice little Instagram story about this, uh, as well as post it on, on LinkedIn and all my other social media so people can find you and find this story. I think there's eight or nine posts so far, and I've, I'm going to do another collection of photographs right now today cool. about the Cat One construction cool that's, that's where we're at so awesome. that story. Yeah. yeah well i'm gonna have this uh i'll have this episode up this by the weekend hopefully okay. and i'll let you know when it goes live and uh i was super stoked and excited to record this with you and just okay. thanks for coming on you bet yeah thank you very much okay see ya